Tonight we're going to imagine together rejoicing in Jerusalem. There's something in each of us that from time to time makes us want to go back to the way it used to be. We want to go back home. We want what seems simpler and more comfortable and more familiar. Sometimes I would like to go back to the home of my youth where my folks are still young and vital and have an answer for every question, a solution for every problem. In the church, we sometimes hearken back to the 1950s when we knew how to grow congregations and expand our facilities and most people considered their church membership to be key to their identity. But what used to be will never be again. And home is never exactly the same. Maybe Thomas Wolfe got it right. You can't go home again. We would all like to go back to paradise, as Barbara Brown Taylor puts it, where there was nothing to hide and nothing to hide from. A place where nothing ever had been broken, where there were no chips or dents or scars. A place where everything was still whole and holy and pleasing to God. Then I realized there are two kinds of not having. There's the not having of never having had and the not having of once having had, but now having lost. Did you get that? It's the latter one that's harder to live with. Through the prophet Isaiah, God is speaking to a people who once had a way of life that is now lost and they long to have it back again. Life had been so good or so they thought. But then the Babylonians swept down among them, killed many of their loved ones and friends, carried off the youngest and the best into a foreign land, occupied their homes, and filled themselves with the produce from the gardens that they, the people of Judah, had planted. The world they had known and loved, their paradise, was destroyed. Eventually, they were allowed to return, and now they are a couple generations away from having come back home. And while they've lived for about 50 years after returning to Jerusalem, things are not the same as they were before. How would you describe the glory of the sunset to a man born blind? How would you describe the delightfulness of your favorite piece of music to a person who is deaf from birth? The challenge in either situation is that words we might choose to convey a concept would have no meaning. Our references would have no correlation in the experience of the person. Without vision, color, for example, is a meaningless word. Blue is not cool or berry flavored. It is just blue. But if someone has never seen anything and has no experience of color, the words we would choose to describe the sunset or even the color blue would be as empty of meaning to them as the incoherent babbling of an infant is to us. This little exercise in imagination is to help us understand the difficulty confronting the prophet Isaiah as he tries to put into words the heavenly, heavenly realities God has pictured for him. Isaiah had help, great help, because God was inspiring him. But still, the task exceeds the power of language to accomplish with any clarity. God is describing heaven here. But he has to use symbols and images and concepts that we can understand to describe a place that's largely unlike anything we have ever experienced. Today, through the words of Isaiah and along with him, we are looking forward to heaven. Those Judeans need something to look forward to, but they still find themselves living in the despair that comes when life is not and seemingly never will be the same or even as good as it once was. They have rebuilt the temple, but Solomon is long dead and only Solomon could construct the temple the way it used to be, the way it really ought to be. It's a rather shabby building compared to his. Rooms out of square, floors not quite level. They've done their best, they suppose, to build God a decent house, but admittedly, it's not much. Even the bling, what there is of it, was provided by their overseers, not collected by King David. It's not what it used to be, for sure. 
The walls surrounding the city still lie in rubble and the residents' hearts and spirits feel unprotected, vulnerable. The houses which survived have been given back to them, but they're not the same. They still smell like the hated Babylonians who occupied them for decades. Their fires, their food, their animals. It's just not the same. It seems that life is always having to be rebuilt. Just ask those people of Judah. And then here comes Isaiah, right into the heart of their despair and longing for a different, better, long ago day. Isaiah shares with the inhabitants of Jerusalem a joyous message of hope, the message that comes straight from God and carries with it the kind of gladness that only God can create and only God can give. Do you remember that Barbara Brown Taylor quote of a moment ago where she speaks of paradise as being a place where nothing had ever been broken, where there were no chips or dents or scars, a place where everything was still whole and holy and pleasing to God. Well, that kind of place doesn't exist for them anymore. But God is now giving his people, Israel, a vision of a new kind of paradise, a restored paradise, where things that were once broken are now repaired, and where there are indeed memories of chips and dents and scars. But in this paradise, all such things are mended and restored, given wholeness and purpose and meaning once again. I suppose that happens for the people too. Wholeness, purpose, meaning once again. But that's not a message of despair. It's a message of hope and redemption. Something new is coming their way. Do you believe that? Life is always needing to be rebuilt. And this is as good a place and as good a time as any for the rebuilding to begin. The Lord reassures this devastated people, the former things will not be remembered or even come to mind. All that recent history had held for Judah, the terror of the Babylonian invasion, the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, the forcible dislocation and abjection of Judean leaders, perhaps even Judah's own sinfulness, will no longer be remembered or even considered. God is creating a new heavens and a new earth. Judah had been under threat from the earliest cultural memories preserved in our biblical tradition. Enslavement in Egypt, living under the shadow of the Assyrian and Babylonian empires, according to the formative narratives, Judah had often struggled on the brink of extinction. It's a central part of biblical testimony that Israel itself has been regularly oppressed and hounded by others. In that context, our hearts may thrill to hear the promise of Isaiah that there will be a new kind of exodus, this time from Babylon. Endless rejoicing will be the portion of the faithful. Isaiah pictures for them the glorification of Zion, the personified Jerusalem. Earlier passages promised that Zion would be vindicated, bejeweled made dazzling as an enduring sign of God's own faithfulness. In our passage, the focus highlights the city's inhabitants. They will be the gems in Zion's crown. They will be the living proof that God loves God's chosen city, God's chosen people. Verses 17 through 19 are absolutely luminous with language of creating and delighting. God sings to his people, I am creating, I'm about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. Peace and righteousness will oversee the life teeming within Zion's gates. Violence, predation, and fear will be no more. The idyllic picture that unfolds in 65 constitutes one of the most beautiful oracles in all of scripture. Here we meet find deep resonance with incarnational theology. God's people will know no more weeping or cries of distress, no more premature loss of life. Homes will be built and inhabited, vineyards planted and their fruit enjoyed. No more ancient terror of being dispossessed by an enemy. Like the days of a tree, my people shall be. 
compare that to what Hosea said. Israel shall strike root like the forest of Lebanon. Her shoots will spread out and her beauty will be like the olive tree. Labor will never again be in vain. No minor promise here. This may reverse the thread in Leviticus of toil bearing fruit only for enemies when God's people do not obey the Torah. Childbirth will yield generation upon generation of offspring. There's a poignant divine word for a traumatized community that felt God's absence keenly during the exile. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear them. Never again will God hide God's face. In verse 25, a utopian vision articulated in the earlier part of Isaiah is reasserted. Wolf, lamb, lion, and ox appear together again. A collocation of creatures evoking the peaceable kingdom of Isaiah 11. A heightened emphasis on erstwhile predators and prey feeding together sets up a contrast at the end of the verse. But the serpent, its food, shall be as dust. That line, three simple but devastating words in Hebrew, brings the Garden of Eden fully into focus. God's curses on the serpent and Adam and Eve are referenced. In the latter days, the primeval ancestors' sorrows will be transformed into joy of blessed offspring and enduring enjoyment of the fruit of human labor. But the curse of the serpent is reaffirmed. The serpent in the future will remain subjugated so that this blessedness will never face that threat again. Thus, the glorious restoration will be of Edenic proportions and cosmic significance. The new heavens and new earth that God is creating will have Zion at the center. A healed Israel will be cherished within the very heart of God's delight. Good news indeed. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The believer is left longing for that place of unending reconciliation and joy. If you believe the Bible, then believe that the very God who came to his people Israel hundreds of years ago comes to this place as well. And the message he gave to his despairing children then is as real and as vital and alive today as it was for centuries before Jesus. We need to take this message and make it personal. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I'm about to create Oak Meadow United Methodist Church as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Oak Meadow United Methodist Church and delight in all my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard there or the cry of distress. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they're yet speaking, I will hear them. This is the word of the Lord. So we're given a choice. We can pine for the good old days, or we can, in faith, consider the possibility that God has something new in store for us. Oh, I suppose there's another option. We can just muddle through, going through the motions, and pretend that what we're doing is really church, but it will catch up to us. So there we are. What will we do? This is what I think God would have us do. Realizing that we live in the world of chips and dents and scars, we place ourselves in the hands of the one who leads us in his direction, knowing that he's the one who makes all things new, and we journey together into what is yet to be. Will that world be like, I wonder? Well, God promises it will be a world where before we even call him, he will answer, and while we're speaking, he will hear us. In other words, God will know our needs and will respond to them in keeping with his will and his intentions. And imagine the Lord God himself rejoicing over us. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty much like paradise to me. So if you believe that is a possibility for us, then you will believe that wholeness 
and purpose and meaning, hope and faith do not just lie behind us, but are ahead of us as well. For we journey forward with a God who indeed makes all things new. Thanks be to the rejoicing God who is still creating. Amen. Let's pray. Come to us in your newness, O Lord, and give us a fresh new vision of faith and hope. The kind which comes only through Jesus, in whom we place our faith and in whom we pray. Amen.